Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about ischemic heart disease. So um, just a really quick definition. So ischemic heart disease is just a condition whereby the heart is starved of oxygen because of like a decrease in blood supply. And the most common cause of ischemic heart disease is the buildup of plaque inside the coronary arteries. So um, the buildup of like fatty um, material inside the coronary arteries which then restricts blood flow and therefore oxygen supply to the myocardium so this is called atherosclerosis um, there are other causes of ischemic heart disease but this is the most common one so um, other causes of ischemic heart disease include um, like an embolus so like a thrombus that breaks off from anywhere else in the body and travels to the coronary um, system and lodges itself in one of the coronary arteries, completely or partially blocking it, and therefore stopping blood supply and um, oxygen supply to that part of the myocardium. Other reasons include like vasculitis, so the inflammation of like the vessels. And obviously if they're inflamed, the lumen will be narrowed, therefore reducing the blood supply and oxygen supply. The final one is vasospasm. So um, the vessel can spasm, it can, constrict, therefore um, limiting, again, the lumen size, decreasing blood supply and decreasing oxygen supply to that specific part of the myocardium. This reduced blood supply and oxygen supply becomes more problematic if we have an increase in oxygen demand in the myocardium. So we might be fine. Um, we might get just enough blood supply and just enough oxygen to carry on <laughs> beating and depolarizing. But if we have um, an increase in demand, an increase in oxygen consumption in the myocardium, then this can be a far worse problem. So for instance, if the heart is beating faster than normal, so if you have like a tachycardic heart, because it's beating faster, it requires more and more and more oxygen. Also, if we have like left ventricular hypertrophy, which means that the left ventricle has gone bigger and it's gone bigger by making more cells. So more heart cells mean more oxygen demand and therefore we get that mismatch in supply and demand. Before we discuss the different types of um, ischemic heart disease, I wanna address the risk factors first for atherosclerosis because as I mentioned, atherosclerosis is the most common cause of ischemic heart disease. So there's a mnemonic that I use to remember the risk factors for atherosclerosis and it's bad heart. So B is for a BMI of, e or of greater than or equal to 30. A is for age, so age that's um, greater than or equal to 65. D is for diabetes. H is for hypertension. E is for excessive alcohol. A is for an increase in LDL and a decrease in HDL. R is for relatives with uh, coronary artery disease. And T is for tobacco use. The different types of ischemic heart disease include stable angina, unstable angina, and STEMI, which is also called um, subendocardial infarct, STEMI, which is also called transmural infarct, and prince metal angina or uh, vasospastic angina. So starting with stable angina. So in the case of stable angina, we have a stable plaque. Okay, so it's stable because the plaque has like a, a fibrous cap preventing it from rupturing. So it's stable. And um, this plaque occludes the artery by about uh, greater than or equal to 70%. Okay, but it's still so Typically, or the patient doesn't really get any symptoms at rest because um, it's not fully occluded to that point where, you know, the patient, the myocardium isn't getting enough oxygen at rest. But when, um, when the patient exercises, runs, or like when there is an increase in oxygen demand, they show symptoms, okay? So they get chest pain, they get shortness of breath. So um, this is... Um, the classic presentation of a stable angina. And the type of chest pain that they get, it's usually a squeezing, a tight, like uh, they describe it as like a, an elephant sitting on, a, on their chest kind of pain. So um, this is typically um, the presentation of a stable angina. So in stable angina, what we have is a subendocardial ischemia. Okay, Ischemia means just 
being starved of oxygen, but it's not an infarct. So nothing, no cells are dead at this point, not yet anyway. So again, a stable angina means that the um, plaque is stable because it has a fibrous cap preventing it from rupturing. Um, the vessel, the artery is occluded to about 70, it is equal or greater than 70%. The patient doesn't show any symptoms at rest, only on exertion. And what we have is subendocardial ischemia. No cells are dead just yet. Moving on to um, unstable angina and STEMI and STEMI, which are all called um, ACS, so acute coronary syndrome. Okay, so um, with unstable angina, what we have is an unstable plaque, meaning that the plaque can rupture, and when it does, it exposes the um, fatty material inside the plaque, which then attract platelets. So the platelets stick together and they stick to the, um, the ruptured plaque, creating a thrombus on top of the plaque. And this occludes the vessel even more. So here we have a near total occlusion. The occlusion is greater than or equal to 90%. So um, in this scenario, the patient can get um, chest pain and um, other symptoms even at rest, but even worse during exertion. All right, so this is what happens when we have an unstable angina. And during unstable angina, we have a subendocardial ischemia. Again, no cells are dead just yet. It's just um, subendocardial ischemia. All right, and then the next one is NSTEMI. So NSTEMI, um, it's also called a subendocardial infarct. So based on the name, now some cells are dead. So in, um, in NSTEMI, we have an unstable plaque, right? Um, it ruptured, so now we have a thrombus on top of the plaque, and we still have a near total occlusion. It's still occluded to about 90% or greater. And um, the difference is um, the myocardial cells are have been starved with oxygen like long enough so around about 30 minutes of unresolved ischemia cells start to die so they've reached that point where they've starved with enough oxygen for an enough amount of time that cells begin to die so now we are seeing subendocardial infarction so that's the difference between an NSTEMI and an unstable angina in unstable angina we only have subendocardial ischemia but in an NSTEMI, we have subendocardial infarct, okay? So the next um, ischemic heart disease type is um, STEMI. So STEMI, it's, it's like, it's really bad because it's a total occlusion. So this means that we have occluded the artery by 100%. So we have a total loss of blood supply, a total loss of oxygen supply. So as you've guessed, <laughs> cells will die. So um, STEMI, it's also called a transmural infarct. So transmural because the cells from the endocardial layer to the epicardial layer, so from the endocardium to the epicardium, that whole layer of myocardium, they're all dead. So that's the difference between um, a STEMI and an NSTEMI. So NSTEMI, we have subendocardial infarct. In STEMI, we have a um, transmural infarct. And in NSTEMI, we have a near total occlusion, so greater than or equal to 90% occlusion. And in STEMI, we have a total 100% occlusion. So in STEMI and NSTEMI, the patient would have symptoms even at rest. The next and final type is called Prince Metal Angina, also called Variant Angina or Vasospastic Angina. So Prince Metal Angina, this has nothing to do with atherosclerosis at all, okay? It's vasospastic. So it happens because the coronary um, arteries, they vasospasm, they spasm, so they constrict, yes? So um, what happens here is it typically happens at night, and um, it usually happens in like young 
females who use and abuse like cocaine and methamphetamines or they take triptans for their migraine so um, they don't really have any obvious cardiovascular risk or no history of like or no known cardiovascular diseases they're just this group of people um, usually um, are at risk for um, Prince Methyl angina. So as I said it's a vasospastic angina and typically happens at night like midnight the coronary arteries they just they just constrict. So that narrows the, the lumen. So this actually causes a transmural ischemia. So from the endocardium to the epicardium that whole myocardial layer is ischemic. It's starved of oxygen. Okay. So the way we diagnose this is we can do um, an ECG. So because we have that transmural involvement, we are actually going to get an SD elevation on our ECG. But when we take the troponin, which is a marker of infarction, because that layer of cells, they're just ischemic. They're, they haven't died yet. There's no infarct involved. So troponin would actually be negative. So we are going to see an SD elevation on the ECG, but troponin would be negative. That's very important. And um, another thing we could do to help diagnose Prince Metal Angina is we can try reproduce um, the symptoms, right? So we can uh, we can reproduce the symptoms by giving them acetylcholine and uh, what's the other one? Ergonavine, yes. And um, this would reproduce the symptoms that they have when they get these sort of vasospastic episodes. So, uh, is there anything else I need to tell you about this? Oh yeah, so in terms of treatment, we can give them um, calcium channel blockers. We can also give them nitroglycerin just to dilate the vessels. We need to avoid, or we, we should not give them beta blockers. This is the reason. So beta receptors in the, um, the vessels. So when those receptors are stimulated, they cause the dilation of the vessels. And the alpha receptors, when they're stimulated, they cause vasoconstriction. So if we give this patients with um, Prince Metal Angina, some beta blockers, it's gonna block beta receptors, meaning that only alpha receptors are available to be stimulated. And recall that alpha receptors contribute to vasoconstriction of the vessels. So we should not give them beta blockers, just calcium channel blockers and nitroglycerin. So now let's talk about the clinical features. So firstly, um, it's chest pain. So um, let's go through the Socrates um, method when assessing chest pain. So S is for sight. So usually the patients would report pain like uh, centrally. So central chest pain and substernal chest pain. So it's in the middle of the chest, like below the sternum kind of pain. O is onset. So um, with stable angina, usually the pain happens after a few minutes when they started like an activity. So for instance, if they went for a jog, the pain starts after you know the activity, a few minutes after the activity. With the case of unstable angina, the pain comes suddenly, even when they're at rest. They could be like watching telly and suddenly they get chest pain. So that's the sort of presentation for unstable angina. So C is for character. So for both of them, the character is um, squeezing. It's tight pain, pressure pain, like an elephant sitting on their chest. But with unstable angina, the pain is typically more intense than that of stable angina, and the pain lasts a bit longer for unstable angina. So R is for radiation. So it radiates typically to the left arm, the neck, and the jaw. Um, Socrates, A. A is for um, alleviating factors and associated symptoms. So alleviating factors. So um, for stable angina, the pain can be alleviated with rest. So it typically improves with rest and with the administration of nitroglycerin. With unstable angina, um, the pain doesn't resolve or doesn't cease even with rest. Associated, associated symptoms. Um, so the chest pain can have associated autonomic symptoms like nausea, vomiting, um, 
like diaphoresis, like sweating um, and like that sense of an impending doom, like something bad and scary is going to happen. So T is timing. So timing, it's usually, patients usually report constant pain. E is for exacerbating factors. So usually exertion exacerbates the pain. Um, S is for uh, severity. So severity, it's variable. Like, I think because different people, you know, have different pain tolerance and they just report different pain severity. It's very important, however, to remember and to keep in mind that some people or like certain populations, they may have a typical chest pain. So a typical chest pain means like silent chest pain. So they can be having a silent MI, like they can be having an MI without showing signs of chest pain. So this can happen in people with diabetes, for example, because they have neuropathy of like certain nerves and therefore they might not actually feel chest pain when they're having an MI. Um, also in elderly populations, as well as um, like heart, like especially recent heart transplant patients, because um, during heart transplant, you know, you don't really reconnect the nerves. So um, there can be alterations within like the nerve signaling system. And therefore the patient doesn't feel chest pain when they're having an MI. So it's very important to keep this in mind. Now I want to talk to you about the complications, but I want to describe this to you in like a in like a chronological order so i want to tell you a story as to what happens when um we have an mi so mainly these the STEMI types so the sd elevation uh, myocardial infarct so um the complications that can arise over time when we have an mi let's start with the first 24 hours um, after an mi so during the first 24 hours after an MI, the tissue permeability in that affected area of the myocardium, the permeability increases, right? So this, this means that that bit of tissue lets more things in, including um, cations, which are positive um, ions like your calcium and your sodium. So lots of those come into that bit of the myocardium, that bit of tissue in the heart. So let's say, for example, that that um, affected area is in the ventricle. So that bit, that little region in, <laughs> that's infarcted has a higher tissue permeability, letting more cations in, which then leads to the depolarization. Because you know, in depolarization, we're increasing the positivity inside of the membrane. So now we have loads of cations in, and that's going to depolarize the membrane. So we have that little bit of area depolarizing in the ventricle. Okay, so what that what does that you know what does that lead to? It leads to that region beating on its own out of the synchronous order of the the, the polarization of the whole ventricle. So this is called a PVC, a premature ventricular contraction. So this PVC can then lead to a VTAC. It can lead to ventricular tachycardia. So because it's beating on its own in, a, in like a faster rate than the rest of the ventricle, it's going to um, generate impulses to make the ventricle, the, the ventricular muscle beat in a faster rate. So that could lead to VTAC and then it can lead to a full-blown V-fib where the ventricle, it's just the ventricles are not beating in a synchronous manner. They're kind of just fibrillating, you know, and during V-fib or not, really getting um, blood out to the systemic circulation. So this can lead to sudden death, right? So, you know, in the films, <laughs> when, when they depict someone having like a heart attack, then that person just dies. It's, it's possible because of this, because we've generated an area that in the ventricle that's um, just contracting on its own, a PVC, which then leads to VTAC to, v to VFib. And if there's no intervention, that VFib can lead to sudden death, okay? So that's how it, it all happens. <laughs> also, they can die from a cardiogenic shock, and I'll explain why. So apart from ge the generation of um, a PVC leading to VFib, um, we can have an acute heart failure. So during the first 24 hours, after a myocardial infarction, especially if that MI is like in the left ventricle, 
what can happen is we can have an acute like left ventricular heart failure. So um, if the infarct is in the left ventricle, that left ventricle, it's not going to do its job properly. So it's not going to pump enough blood to the systemic circulation, decreasing our cardiac output, decreasing our blood pressure. So when we decrease our blood pressure, we get hypotensive, right? And because our body wants to fix this, we get reflex tachycardia to compensate for a drop in blood pressure. Also, because we've decreased our cardiac output as the left ventricle is not doing its job properly because there's a bit of tissue there that's infarcted, um, we're not pumping enough blood to the systemic circulation. And if we do this um, to a massive degree, like if we drop our cardiac output very, very low, it can lead to cardiogenic shock, which can then lead to death. So that's another way that the person can die, but it doesn't really happen that quickly like what they depict in films. But anyway, you can you can die from, from, from an MI because of these mechanisms. Also, because the left ventricle has failed, um, it's not doing its job, it's not pumping blood out to the systemic circulation, some of that blood is going to back up to the lungs. So when that happens, we can develop flash pulmonary edema, which can then lead to sudden onset of like hypoxia, of dyspnea, shortness of breath, um, because now we have fluid in our lungs. So that's what happens during the first 24 hours um, post-MI. From 24 hours to three days, what can happen is that we can get rupture syndrome. So because of um, the infarction, that bit of tissue that's affected, they actually become very fragile. They become very weak and very susceptible to rupturing. So for instance, if we have um, that infarcted tissue, um, in our septum that's separating the two ventricles. If that bit of tissue ruptures, okay, we can create a VSD. We can create um, a hole in, in that um, septal wall that, um, that means that blood can be shunted from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, from high pressure to low pressure, right? Um, so blood can shunt from the left side to the right side through that ventricular hole, that, through that VSD. So um, the symptoms would be um, a holosystolic murmur. And this means that we're creating uh, mixed venous blood. So in, in the venous system, there's a mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So um, another scenario is if we have um, that infarct in the left ventricle. So if you have that infarct in the left ventricle, which is susceptible to rupture, when it ruptures, blood can leak out from the left ventricle to the pericardial cavity. And this can create an, an acute cardiac tamponade. Um, another scenario could be, for instance, if we have that um, infarcted tissue um, in the papillary muscles, which are anchoring the valves um, into their places. So now, like if that papillary muscle um, has that, you know, weak, fragile tissue and it ruptures, that papillary muscle isn't going to hold the valve tightly. So we can get um, regurgitation syndrome. So this can actually lead to like, for instance, my, mitral regurgitation um, or any regurgitation of the, of the valves in the heart. So this can happen within 24 hours to three days post MI. Between three and 14 days, we can get pericarditis as a complication of the MI. Um, so this happens because that infarcted tissue, they attract immune cells. And when they attract immune cells, they create like a local inflammatory response, which then irritates the nearby pericardium. So when that pericardium gets irritated, um, we can develop pericarditis. So uh, in pericarditis, we can get like chest pain, which is sharp and it's positional, and we can hear a uh, friction rub, and this can lead to pericardial effusions. From 14 days to one month, um, recall that the tissue that's infarcted becomes weak, becomes fragile, and therefore susceptible to rupture. So um, because they're susceptible to damage, we can get left ventricular aneurysms from day 14 to one month. And these aneurysms, A, they may rupture and cause significant bleed. So into the, um, so bleeding into the pericardial cavity, leading to cardiac tamponade. Or um, 
they can just stay as left ventricular aneurysms but then because that aneurysm becomes like a little pocket of blood where where, where there's a stasis of blood you know this this creates like um remember was a Vir virchow's triad when we have stasis of blood it's more likely to for, to form like thrombi in that region so we form like this increases the risk of the formation of mural thrombi which can then break off and travel to different parts of the body like to the brain creating you know a stroke to the mesenteric circulation um to the spleen to the kidneys cutting off blood supply to those um, organs and damaging those organs during that process. So that can happen. Also, we have um, this called, uh, what is it, Dress Dressler? Dressler syndrome, which is when the immune system, um, they it's, a real, it's, a, it's an immune system response to that damaged tissue in the heart, okay? So damaged tissue from the infarct um, triggers our immune system. So we produce like antibodies, which then attack the heart and the pericardium, um, creating a like a pericarditis type of pain.